Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, welcome so much. Welcome so much. I don't know. You guys, this, this year, this week, this day, uh, I'm Jillian Manning, the articulate uh, new director of the National Writers Series. <laughs> Thank you for cheering for my being articulate. Uh, I am, I'm so happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy that we can be out at the beautiful Civic Center Amphitheater. I'm happy that we can be together safely, and I'm happy that we have Pam Houston here. Uh, for those that saw the email, it's been more than 500 days since we first tried to get her here. So a round of applause for getting Pam to Traverse City. So it actually worked out perfectly. The Great Outdoors is the perfect place to have her here. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to do a couple of thank yous because there's a lot that goes into making this particular event even come to life. So to our friends at the City Opera House, we miss you, we love you, we can't wait to be back with you, and we will be soon. Uh, to our new friends at the Civic, Sever Civic Center and to Parallel 45, whose beautiful dome I am standing under, thank you guys for helping us and letting us share your space. To Travers Area Community Media, who is live streaming, and hello to everybody at home. I don't know where the cameras are, but hello. Uh, and our friends at Leelanau Sound, Two Bays DJs, and our awesome musician, Blair Miller. Thanks for entertaining us, you guys. And then to some very important friends, Interlock and Public Radio, The Record Eagle, and Horizon Books. If you have not already gotten a copy of Pam's book, Deep Creek, there are books that are signed for sale back there, so be sure to pick one up before you go. Our sustaining sponsor, Cordia, our fall season sponsor, West Shore Bank, and our arts benefactor sponsor, Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network. We're so grateful for your support, not just for this event, but throughout our entire season, and for Cordia and Northwest Michigan Arts and Culture Network for staying, sticking with us for a very, very long time through COVID, which felt like many years, but I'm told is just one. Um, and to our sponsor for tonight's event, Grand Travers Pie Company, uh, they are actually celebrating 25 years this year of being in the pie business. Uh, I think I have been a, a, a self-appointed and unofficial taste tester for 20 of those years. Uh, so I can tell you they are amazing. We're so grateful to be working with them. And the crumb topping is the best thing that's ever been made. Um, Actually, and Pam, you got to, we had some for dessert after our dinner tonight, so strawberry rhubarb, and it was fantastic. Um, I'm also really grateful for the support of our two community partners tonight. Uh, you saw one of them out front, Grass River Natural Area. I hope you got to play the fun scat game. They are a fabulous preserve in uh, Bel Air and Antrim County area, and we took a hike there yesterday with Pam, and it was absolutely stunning. Um, and, and as part of that hike, we were walking with some friends from the Travers Bay Children's Advocacy Center, and they are a group, uh, I want to make sure I get their wording right here, our regional response center for the investigation of crimes against children whose goal is to provide justice, hope, healing, and healing for children and families. Um, you may have seen their banners flying around downtown recently. They're kicking off their big fundraiser today, and obviously this is something very near and dear to our hearts and to our guest host and our author tonight. So big round of applause for all of those folks. And then last but definitely not least, thank you so much to our volunteers, to our staff, our board, everybody here tonight, our donors and supporters. And our event is made possible in part by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And now to introduce our special guests for the evening. Pam Houston is the award-winning author of several books and short story collections. Many of you may know her from Cowboys Are My Weakness. Uh, if you haven't read that, it's fabulous. And tonight she's here to talk about her memoir, Deep Creek, which actually came out a couple of years ago. Um, COVID slowed us down and we're back to talk about it tonight. And it chronicles life, love, loss, uh, healing, everything on this beautiful ranch in the Colorado Rockies. And uh, I just wanted to share two beautiful pieces um, of reviews that were given to the book. Kirkus gave it a starved review calling it a profound and inspiring love letter to one piece of earth. And Cheryl Strayed, who's the author of Wild, said, this book is for all of us right now. 
Pam will be in conversation tonight with the wonderful Crystal Frost, who you know is a popular media personality in northern Michigan. She's the host of Frost and McCarty on News Talk WTCM. She hosts food and travel uh, programs and is actively involved in many community groups, including the Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center. So thank you guys all again so much for being with us tonight. And please join me in welcoming Pam and Crystal. Alrighty then, hello everyone. This is just lovely, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's nice to be outside. Oh, it's so nice to be outside. And did you see we had a little cooler back there? It's, it was water, it's not full on camping here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Um, as the wonderful Jillian had said, uh, it is just a pleasure to be here today with Pam Houston, who is a prize winning author and a professor of English at the University of California, Davis. You told me backstage that you're working and teaching so much right now. And I just want to start with that. That has kind of become your passion, uh, or maybe taking over other passions over the last couple of decades. It's true. Um, I teach at the University of California, Davis. I also teach at the Institute of American Indian Arts. and. Between those two jobs, I probably oversee 10 to 15 theses a year, which will turn into books, and um, hopefully in most cases. And that has become uh, my real passion, elevating the young voices. Um, I have a strong belief that if there's any hope for us, it's um, young writers, a lot of them from communities that have not always been celebrated by literature, <clears throat> getting their books into the world. I was Tommy Orange's uh, thesis advisor. Probably a lot of you read there, there. If you didn't, you should. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was probably the best book of the last decade, in mm. my humble opinion, as his teacher. <laughs> um, but uh, nominated for a Pulitzer, nominated for the National Book Award, incredible book. Um, set in Oakland um, about the native urban experience. Yeah. So teaching, and you said something there when you were talking about the students finding hope. If, if we have any more hope <laughs> for what is happening with our earth and our country and our world right now, it's through the young voices. But finding hope was a big theme in your memoir. And, and, and I, I want to call it a memoir, but it's also very much an almanac. Um, very much, even you know, talking about kind of the day to day on the ranch, and each almanac features another picture of one of the wonderful souls that live on the ranch. Um, and you effortlessly sort of dip out of the present, the past, the distant past, and kind of into the middle of what kinds is kind of going on. And when I was reading it, I was I was actually um, talking to somebody about your book, and I said it feels as though the week I spent reading it, I was living inside your head. Mm. Because that's the way your thoughts sort of were transpiring. It, was that intentional? Yeah, I mean, one thing it was not was effortless. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, when I, for me as a writer, I love to have a form. I, I feel, I, I never want to know what it's about. I always say the three questions I don't let into my writing room are what does it mean? Where is it going? How does it end? I, I'm not interested in any of that. What I want instead of that, or instead of an outline, or instead of a plan, is I want a shape to hold in my head um, that, I, that I fill. I want a container to fill. And in my last book, that container was a 12-sided Rubik's Cube, which was super complicated. This book was simpler. I want it to, to be a calendar. And I was sure that it should be a calendar because um, because anyone who lives on a piece of land that you're connected to, especially if you're raising animals, know that if you 
ignore the calendar, things are going to die. You know, mm -hmm. the calendar mm -hmm. is probably your most important touchstone if you raise animals, especially if you live in a place with extreme weather, as I know you do. Um, so I wanted the book to be a calendar, and I wanted it to be a calendar so badly that I started writing January, you know, a whole bunch of text. <laughs> February, a whole bunch of text. And I was so literal about it and so committed to this idea of a calendar, I burned about two years banging my head against a wall trying to make something that wouldn't be a calendar into a calendar. Right. <laughs> and because, as you said, the story was bigger than that and it needed to go way back in time and it, it, I at first wanted it to never leave the ranch and then I realized it had to leave the ranch some. Mm. And um, eventually, and so then I said to myself, okay, it can't be a calendar. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't, that's not your form. So instead you're gonna write a book that is a formless form. Like these are the lies, you know, that writers tell themselves. So I was like, okay, the form is the formless form, I said, to make myself feel better. And then I just kind of pushed a bunch of words out of my mouth or out of my fingers for another year and a half. And then I looked at what I had, you know, I had all these chapters, no particular order. And then I had these little pieces these ranch almanac pieces, which were not intentionally ranch almanac pieces. I had, I do everything in 12s, I always have, I don't know why. Um, so I had these 12 fat chapters and then I had these 12 or 12-ish little pieces that were super ranch centric. And I was like, there is my calendar, it came back. Yeah. And so those 12 ranch almanac sections are absolutely deliberately put in order of the calendar year. Yeah even though they occur in different years. <laughs> and I was so dedicated to that idea of getting my calendar back that I had to change the Perseid meteor shower to the Leonid meteor shower <laughs> so that it would fit in the November slot, which wasn't very hard. I just had to put warmer clothes on, you know, and um, I just had to rewrite it slightly so that it was, I was in a sleeping bag instead of a down parka, you know, watching the meteor shower. But so anyway, um, all of this is just to say form is very important to me. It's like a stay against infinity. It's what keeps me from despair. Mm. And um, so, yes, the, the, the spine of the almanac and its adherence to the real calendar allowed those longer chapters to roam and go wherever they wanted. Mm -hmm. When, you, when you're talking about form keeping you from despair and kind of the, the pattern that a form has, something you can count on, it's interesting because I, I, I know this was on the National Writer Series um, Facebook page and website. It was an essay that was published in one of your earlier books, A Little More About Me, which was kind of a first memoir for you. In a way. In a way. Um, and it was detailing a fishing trip that you took with uh, Jack Driscoll and Michael Delp and Nick Bosniak and our very own Doug Stanton. Um, and the essay basically gives your first impression of northern Michigan while you were wading into the Platte River at 2 a.m. with four men and you were just waist high, maybe, maybe higher than that, in mud, almost drowning. And you're actually giggling to yourself. And at one point during the essay, um, you, your thoughts are kind of racing. You're asking yourself, you know, what am I doing here? <laughs> and... <laughs> And you said something that really, really stood out to me. You said, because touching this wildness is the best way I know to undermine sadness. And so even then in the, you know, the mm -hmm. early 90s when you are experiencing this and then writing the essay and then publishing the essay, you kind of understood that the wild and the, and the unknown was sort of your, your time of healing. So how do you think the form and the wild go together? Mm, that's so interesting. Wow, what an interesting question, um, right? Because when I'm in the wilderness, I'm searching for things that don't have patterns, right? Right. Or maybe that's not true. Maybe the wilderness is full of patterns. They're just not patterns that we recognize. You know, Barry Lopez 
who we lost last year. I'm sure you know that. Um, he said, we're pattern makers. And if our patterns are beautiful and true enough, they will have the power to bring someone for whom the world has become chaotic and disorganized up from their knees and back to life. Mm. That's a sentence I carry around with me and say a lot to students. Um, so there's something in there. It's such a good question. I wish I had a better answer. There's something about, for me, picking up hunks of the wild, right? Mm -hmm. And bringing them to the page. And then listening for how they interact with my own interior landscape, mm -hmm. right? My mm -hmm. interior joys and traumas and trying to trying to find a pattern or a mm -hmm. form that um, that allows me to dig in as deep as possible yeah. to that connection yeah and um, I mean art is form right mm -hmm. I mean I, I I keep thinking of Andy Goldsworthy you know and all his spirals and his sticks and like he's out there making forms, but he's making forms that don't um, violate the natural sense of yes. things. There's something like that that I'm going for, oh, yeah. except with story. <laughs> yeah, and and you do it so well, and and I was picking up on those. I mean, from the from really reading through and realizing that you had put the calendar, the almanac in there very purposely, mm -hmm. um, and you know the way that you're talking about sort of living through this very organized um, life that you need. You know what you need to do on the ranch. You, you know, you figured it out sometimes the hard way and mm -hmm. you had to find some, um, some, some strangers at times that became friends to help you. But you, you started writing, I think, about some of the traumas of the past in such an interesting way. And you wrote about your mother's alcohol abuse and depression you actually started off with really talking about how you survived 16 really violent car crashes. And that, I mean, to, to say that you had alcohol and, you know, your, your parents' alcohol abuse, that's, I mean, that is a lot of car crashes. <laughs> that, to me, that's like, okay, there was absolutely no learning <laughs> here with, with your parents. And you talk about her, um, her alcohol abuse, how it worsened in the fall and into the winter. And you, you sort of decidedly had some tools with the ranch to prepare you for that. But I wonder, did you have any tools to prepare you for the, the fall and the winter and the, all of the months living with abusive parents? At home, you mean? Yeah. Oh, you know, I had, there was always someone, you know, I, I write about Martha Washington. Martha Washington in this book who uh, my mom my mom liked to party and she had me in the hospital and then she wanted to go to a party and she went down to the bulletin board in the hospital to look for babysitters and she found on that bulletin board this woman named Martha Washington who basically didn't leave until I was about 21 and she, you know, everything that's okay about me yeah. began with Martha Washington. And she protected me in as much as she could from my violent father. She took me away when my parents were too drunk to function. Um, so, so many things about Martha Washington that made me okay. And the funny thing is, back in that stage where I was writing Deep Creek and I was determined not to leave the ranch, I was like, how can I get Martha Washington in this book? Because she died long before right. I owned the ranch, a decade before. And, and, then, and it was really Martha Washington that made me understand that I didn't have to follow my own rule of mm. staying tight yeah. to the ranch because there would have been no ranch without Martha Washington because she made me believe in myself. She gave me an avenue to believe in myself. But in addition to Martha Washington, there were always friends, there were always teachers, mm -hmm. um, there was always someone. 
uh, in, in uh, a little more about me, I write an essay about Colonel Bob Miller, this guy in our neighborhood that took all the kids camping. I owe a lot of my love of the wilderness to him, even though we didn't go to the wilderness at all. We went to sort of a glorified city park, but he made us fall in love with trees and trails. Um, so there was always someone. Uh, I have a picture of myself sitting on my mother's lap on a swing when I'm like one and a half. Mm -hmm. And you can just see by my face right there, I'm like, somebody here is gonna be nice to me. <laughs> and I just out. have to find that yeah. person. And I've always been good at that. I got a pie, I got a pie. <laughs> I was only here for like a day. And I got a pie and I got a Petoskey stone <laughs> right here. I got a Petoskey stone. So, um, you know, I think I was blessed with the ability to look out and see somebody who would, you know, get me out of trouble or better yet, give me a pie, you know. Um, <laughs> and I've, I have had that and I've been lucky about that. And, and uh, you know, I'm a yes sayer. I always have been. And sometimes that gets me into a little bit of trouble. but. Overall, it leads me to really fantastic experiences. I, do you think that, you know, because you have such a love of adventure, and we've, we've been following, you know, both your personal stories, but also your character stories over these past two, you know, two and a half decades. And, and you know, I think that it's interesting because you write, er, you know, early on in this book, and, and you've written about this before, about that you're most comfortable with a plane ticket in your hand. Like, you didn't really want a place to call home. Home didn't have a lot of meaning that was at least good for you. Um, but then, you know, you c came about the ranch and it became this place where you, you really, it's like the first home you really had in some ways. Um, and, and I also wonder too, because the ranch can be really, really hard. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, there have been so many weather events in the last, number of years and you know knowing that you're going to get 48 inches of snow after it's all just melted and knowing that you're going to have fires that are going to be coming more and more thanks to global warming and climate change do you ever feel betrayed by this place that you've trusted so much no uh a couple things to say about that i love to fly mm. i love to go i this is the first place i've flown since covid and I thought I would be really scared. And I was so happy. And I was so happy after I landed just to be somewhere, like just driving in the car. I was so happy to like, oh, look, I'm here in a place that is far away from where I started this morning. It made me so happy to fly. Um, so thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me the <laughs> opportunity to fly. Um, but no, I have not felt betrayed by the ranch. That would be crazy. <laughs> um, we have betrayed the earth. <laughs> you know, I have betrayed the earth. Like I just was talking about how much I love to fly. You know, I am a betrayer of the earth. And those fires that are happening at the ranch are nobody's fault but ours, you know. And um, no, the ranch is good. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a good place. And and we we have abandoned you know its goodness yeah. for greed and um, and it's a tragedy you know but uh, the ranch is very good and we had a um, I mean it, it the ranch doesn't ha doesn't harm anyone <laughs> it would never um, we might harm ourselves because of our stupidity on the ranch. Like I might fall off my roof trying to sweep my chimney or something, <laughs> but that wouldn't be the ranch's fault. Um, you know, it's it, the what's happening in the West. I mean, I know it's happening everywhere, and I know you have your own version of it. And I heard that the cherry farmers were sad about all the rain, and so I know it's happening everywhere. Right. Um, it's in the in the in the American Southwest. We're the poster child for yeah. it, and it's so in our faces, and it's so obvious. I, I saw in the New York Times article the other day when the mayor of New York said this was a real wake up call. She said, and I thought, wake up call. Like you know, we're so deep in it out there, and 
I, you know, there's nothing to say about this it's, except we have to love the damage, you know, we have to love the damaged earth and love each other as we go into this, as we go into this catastrophe. We have to love each other because it's going to get really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ranch just reflects that, though it's still beautiful. And we happen to have a lot of rain this summer, a relative lot of rain in the middle of this 20-year drought. And it's beautiful. The flowers, we have all kinds of, we have a pasture, we have flowers. It was a beautiful summer, um, and you just have to take that and say, if that's the last one, it was beautiful. Um, and do our best, you know? You know, Pam, I was telling you this afternoon that I had to reread the essay of, of a fire in your book. And I mean, it's a, it's a gripping read, but it's also, again, very much, um, almost as if you are the journalist who wants to capture everything that is happening, not only out west, but it's happening to your property, to the, you know, the towns that you love and to your area and to your neighbors. How difficult was that for you, not only to go through, clearly, but then to come back and write it? You know, I'm so interested in everything. You know, I really am. Like, I'm... I, it serves me well as a writer because I can get interested in everything, even catastrophe. And I was so interested in firefighting and in the language of firefighting. And in that essay, what I'm trying to do is recreate my experience mm -hmm. of going to the internet and learning what a Pulaski is and learning what a backburn is. And, you know, I was so engaged. I was a student of that fire. And I wanted to learn everything about it. And and when I read stuff on the internet about our fire, it led me to the glossary of wildland firefighting terms yeah. because I wanted to learn the language. And part of that is is a fear reaction. Like, you know, I, I feel like the more information I have, the more equipped I am to go through a thing. Yeah. And But it was also just fun to learn about firefighting and to learn about beetle kill and to learn about these mega fires and why they're doing what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And um, so I'm, I'm a learner no matter what, you know, and, and so that was part of it with the fire. Um, you even say uh, in the chapter, you write that if the fire goes out, if the summer ever ends, you will never be afraid in the same way for the ranch again. And that's because of the knowledge that you were able to obtain. That's right. And one thing I learned is that I don't really have a very big chance of burning down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was the only home in my whole end of the county not to be evacuated. And I still don't know whether that was just, you know, an oversight. Somebody skipped my name on the list. Or if it was because I do live... Um, with a, with a stand of aspen on my border, which is better for fires than pines or spruce, and also because I have quite a bit of meadow between me and the trees. And so it was probably intentional yeah. that I was not evacuated. Everyone else, like a person just, just 200 yards down the road was evacuated, wow. but I wasn't. The firefighters could see my house from their camp. And so I won't be afraid in the same way again because I understand how fire works. Yeah. And um, when it when the fire began, the fire was like my dad, right? And mm -hmm. he was coming, and I didn't know whether he was going to hurt me or kill me. And then I learned about fire, so I learned there was a difference between the fire and my dad. And yeah. you know, and the fire is much more predictable. <laughs> it turns out. Um, so yeah, I mean, learning about these things, you know, there, there's, I don't know how many of you have read Terry Tempest Williams' book uh, called Erosion, which is kind of a, a book about the climate and many other things. And the, the really profound thing I took from that book, I mean, I always take lots of things from Terry's books, but the really profound thing I took is she said, you know, as, as Americans and maybe even as humans, we're always like, how are we going to get through this? Like, we're going to buckle down and we're going to work hard and we're going to get through it. And she says, you know, with climate, there there is no through it, you know? Yeah. There's only into it. We're only going into it. So given that, given that we're only going into it, 
you know, how are we going to be? How are we going to yeah. be? And, and what I want to do is bear witness. Um, that, that's very calming to me, like yeah. to know the truth about what's happening, to learn the language of it, and to witness it and record it. That's maybe a lot of people would say, well, that's no help. <laughs> and that may be true. Um, but it's, it's my reaction. It's, it's how I want to be. It's how I want to go in it with my eyes open and bearing witness. You know, I, I found it so interesting, and, and I know you have so many fans in the crowd uh, today, and, and I think this book resonates with people for so many different reasons, but two of the reasons, one being, you know, the love of, your love of the earth, your love of the environment, and your, you know, your, your desire to protect it, and that idea that, you know, there are people in our world who would choose rather to pretend it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same thing with the child abuse. I think there are people in the world that would rather choose that it's not happening and therefore makes both kind of difficult to talk to with people if they kind of have their blinders up. And there was a moment in your book when you write about your mom. And it was really interesting when you were there visiting from college, you're about 25 years old and you're watching baseball with your dad and she was got a phone call and was leaving to, I suppose, meet and say goodbye and shake the hand of the man who abandoned her after her mother um, died in childbirth. With her. With her. And you, you offered to go with her and she told you to stay. And I think, I, I know that you wanted the audience maybe to understand something a little more deeper about your mother there, but I, all I could focus on was how you were going to stay with your father as an adult after the abuse had ended, watching baseball for a number of days. And what was that like to be in a room with someone, both knowing the truth, but neither talking about it? Yeah, um, you know, I spent a lot of time with my dad you know, after the abuse was over. I mean, not a lot of time, but that was not a unique moment yeah. when my mom went to meet her father and left me there. She was only gone 24 hours. It was a crazy thing she did. Uh, she went to Florida to shake his hand to shake his for hand. 24 hours. And that's what and he's... And then she flew back to New Jersey. Um, and then she never talked about it again. Never. I said, what happened? She said, I shook his hand. Um, speaking of not talking about stuff. Uh, but... Um, you know, a lot of people asked when I was on tour with this book, like, you know, you talk about what your father did, and then you're watching baseball with him. How could you have done that, you know? And I know that's not what you were asking, but I did get that question a lot, and it occurs to me that I wasn't clear enough about it. You know, if my father, my father's deceased, but, you know, if he walked in right now, I would try to make him laugh. You know, I would try to make him proud of me. I would say something about baseball, to, you know, because that would make him happy. Like, I don't think of him as a monster, you know, and one reason I don't think of him as a monster, even though he did monstrous things, he broke my femur when I was four, there was tons of sexual abuse. It, you know, I've had literally hundreds of students, maybe, maybe a thousand students over the course of my life who were abused in their homes. It's, a, it's an epidemic, mm. you know? It's so normal, and we don't talk about it as if it's normal. Yeah. Um, and, and it's so common, it's so, so common. I call it in the book as common as a two-car garage. That's how it feels to me, because so many students have come into my life and written their stories yeah. of abuse. So. You know, my father was super unhappy and he did really terrible things to me, but he was funny and he gave me my love of travel and he taught me about baseball. the NHL and baseball. And like, I just don't, you know, I never, I never severed the relationship. I got too big for him to hurt me. And then we just talked about hockey. <laughs> And, and maybe that's like the wrong answer, but no, it's, but it's my right answer, answer, you know? Yeah. And if I didn't think that was happening in more homes than it isn't happening in, I might feel weird about that. But I know it is because all those people have come to me 
for help and support in telling their own stories of very similar things. Because it's so common, it has been normalized. Right. Or something. Mm. I mean, I think it's one of those things we pretend isn't common. And yet, if you look at the statistics, it's so common. Yeah. Like, we have the numbers that show how common it is. So, I don't know. You know, I, I think to myself a lot, Crystal, I think, what would my life be if it hadn't been that? Yeah. You know, which is not... There's a lot plane. of planes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's... Um, it was true. My dad sexually abused me for a little more than a decade. He broke my femur when I was four, and I have a crooked leg because of it, though I do okay. Um, but what would my life be if I hadn't, if they hadn't been my parents? Mm. I don't know the answer. Like, would I have the compassion that I have for my students? Would I have learned to look out to whoever was going to give me a pie and smile at them? Like, would I, you know, I'm going to be 60 really soon, a couple of months. And uh, I've had the best life. Like, how could I have had a better life? Right. So for me to sit here and be like, oh, yeah, you know, it was horrible. My dad was horrible. I mean, he was horrible. <laughs> like, that's not arguable. But, you know, it made me turn to Martha Washington, and it made me mm. turn to my wonderful liberal professors at Denison who wore ceramic peace signs around their neck. And it made me, you know, love the world. And to get back to the start of your question, it made me understand that the earth was my mother. You know, mm. the earth mothered me. It, it mothered me. It parented me. It grew me up. And to this day, if I'm really sad, I will go curl around a tree. Like, I'll just get down on the ground and curl around a tree and sleep and take a nap there because because I was mothered by nature, by the earth. And that's one reason that I'm so sad about her destruction, you know, because yeah. she's my mother. Mm -hmm. And I'd do anything for her in the way that some people would do anything for their actual mothers. I wouldn't, but... <laughs> but I would for the earth. You have this beautiful relationship with all of the animals um, on the ranch, just this beautiful relationship. And you, you, know, you said something, and, it, and I felt this way so many times, and I have two very um, obnoxious dogs, but they're my obnoxious dogs. Mm -hmm. And I have said before, there has never been anybody in the world more happy to see me, no matter what. Dogs are the, and, and animals in general, are the epitome of unconditional love. And you write so beautifully. You've written so many beautiful essays about your relationship with your animals. Um, and, and tell me how you, you know, how, how you go into those relationships. When I was write, reading about Fenton, and I think about this because I've had, be beside my two little ones I have now, I have had one big dog in my life. And I didn't think I could love again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is something that you've, you've been able to do because I'm assuming because it's just so worth it. Like, real love is worth it. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm, uh, I love all my dogs. I do not love them all equally but I love them all a lot. And I have had no problem, you know, e even though when Dante died, that's the dog I wrote the book Sight Hound about, like I thought I'll never love again, but I really didn't really think that. Right. And it turned out to be absolutely not true because then I loved Fenton and that love was just as big as Dante love. And now I love Livy, which makes me feel good because she's a she and it's not just the boys that yeah. I can love that much. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I just read a book last night. To, it's not out yet. It's by Jenna Blum. It's called Woodrow on the Bench and it's about the last summer of her big love dog's life. And I was trying to write a blurb and I, last night at like two in the morning and I was trying not to use cliches. And, you know, it's, 
what I ended up saying was like, this book will make doc, you know, anyone who's been, you know, in the gale force wind love of a dog happy because no one in this book ever thinks or says it's only a dog. You know? No, yeah. <laughs> when Woodrow is reaching the end of his life and, you know, dogs taught me how to love and I got to practice on them, you know, mm -hmm. I got to practice on them. I mean, Martha Washington did a little, but she was, she was a supply sergeant in the army. Like she was tough love, yeah. Martha Washington. <laughs> like she wasn't gooey at all. She just did what she said, which seemed like a miracle after my parents, you know, and she showed up for me always. But she was not loving, per se. And so dogs taught me how to love, and I got to practice loving on dogs. And I honestly believe, honestly, like I'm married now to a really good guy, and yeah. I know that is shocking to everybody. <laughs> not um, at all, Pam. I... <laughs> I, I did it right against all odds here at the final hour. And, and the reason is because I got to practice on my dogs like for like 30 years. <laughs> like they taught me how to do it right. Yeah. And, and I finally did it right. I finally picked a good one and I finally loved him back. And that's because of all that practice I had with dogs and a few horses, but especially the, the dogs. Yeah. Oh, it's it, the, the Parts about the dogs, oh my gosh, anybody who loves dogs, absolutely, you know that. Um, and, you know, I have just a couple more questions here, and I know we have so many people anxious to ask you questions. You know, I know that writers often mine from their own lives when they're creating the characters of their stories. And since reading um, kind of your first, and a little more about me, and then reading Deep Creek, and knowing your other work, and reading those characters, I can see you in so many of them. So does it feel odd to say that, you know, you you just wrote a memoir when really you've been kind of writing your life this whole time? Yes, that is true. Um, I have been kind of writing my life the whole time. Um, I didn't really want to write a memoir because I thought I had been sort of doing it all along in mm -hmm. my way, mm -hmm. which was like this very loose fictionalization. Um, and I'm a trained fiction writer. I'm not a trained memoirist. <sighs> what I learned writing the memoir, the memoir was much harder to write than I expected. It took much longer. I thought I was just going to be able to toss it off, which is a ridiculous thing to think about any book. But we think it every time. And then that turns out not to be the case. But. Here's what I learned about the difference between fiction as I practice it, which I guess we now call autofiction, which I kind of like. I kind of like that people that do what I do have been legitimized by this term autofiction that now everyone's using. But the difference is with autofiction or fiction, like if I'm bored with myself, mm -hmm. which is a constant state of the writer, if I'm bored with myself, I can just make something up. Like I can blow up a car or I can have a sexy Italian walk in the room or, <laughs> you know, or a sexy Great Dane or whatever. Um, <laughs> but with this memoir, that plane is just going around it really and is. around. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's very interested in what you have to say. <laughs> um, but with memoir, I really did, you know, with this book, try to stick as much as possible to the truth as I understood it of what really happened. Now, we all know that's impossible. And I think probably on any page of Deep Creek, I could find something and say, mm, I'm not sure that was really, you know, but I tried, <laughs> which yeah. I think is what kind of matters. Um, so because I could, because when I got bored, I couldn't, have a sexy Great Dane walk in, I had to wait, you know, like, yeah. like fiction feels very vertical. It feels all about hills and valleys or explosions. And memoir felt like water kind of sinking down into a field. Mm -hmm. And you had to sort of wait for the crops to grow up. You had to wait for that saturation point where meaning would arise. And I didn't like it but it was good for me, yeah. you know, it was good practice. And it, I'm now writing short stories again, 
and I'm finding, um, I'm having more fun. I don't know. Writing the memoir taught me something. It expanded my notion of what a story can do. Mm. That's one way to say it. But, um, but yeah, you know, I because of my method of writing, which is that I pay really strict attention in the world and I pick up details and bring them to the page and then I mash all those glimmers, I call them yeah. together. Like my work is always going to be um, related to me fairly intensely because I trust my physical experience of the world more than I trust something that you might call my imagination. Mm. You know, I, I just have to say that when your first book came out, which was just a smash success and gave you the ranch with that $21,000, Cowboys Are My Weakness, and the wonderful Donna Blair who gave you the opportunity to have that ranch and to continue to become a little bit more um, entrenched in the earth and in love with the earth and the animals on the ranch. It's, it's an amazing story. But you were first called a badass <laughs> after Cowboys. And then a little more about myself, you were even more of a badass. And your, your, your essays, even the essay going fishing with Doug Stanton, you're a badass <laughs> who's like making note of Honor State Bank is 1.21 a.m. These are things that I think people have said, Pam Houston is somebody who is living life and being so cool about it. But what makes you, I, to me, the bravest of badasses is is taking that moment to to really these years to write this memoir and to dig into places that weren't, um, you know, w were real. Yeah, um, I'll tell you the way that the abuse stuff got into the memoir is that you know, again, I started out ranch-centric, just the years I was on the ranch. Very calendar. Right <laughs> deeply into the pasture, I kept saying, Pam. Uh, the calendar, the almanac, right? And I turned in the book, and my agent said to me, isn't this the book where you really talk about what happened to you as a child? And I said, I haven't done anything except that my whole life. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, you haven't. And it was just one of those come to Jesus moments because I thought I had written about nothing except my father and the way he treated me. And, you know, anyone who has a history of abuse sees it. Yeah. They can smell it mm -hmm. in Cowboys or mm -hmm. Waltzing the Cat or any of the books. But um, but I, she said, you've never written about it the way you write about bailing hay or birthing lambs. What if you just wrote about it straightforwardly? Yeah. And um, and so I said, all right, because at that point you're eight years in and you'll do anything they say, you know, because <laughs> you just want to hand it off. And and this is uh, this is this is probably not a story I should tell, but I'll tell it. Um, so my my editor and I quarreled quite a bit about this book, um, and we were reaching consensus and we were getting there and it was good and then she sent me this email and she said you know you've been so coy about the abuse and this is me too time and you should just say exactly what happened to you you owe it to your audience and I said all right okay because again at that point if she said you know would you take off all your clothes and run into traffic you would do it if it meant she would take the book away from you and say, we're going to press now. And, and so I just wrote it. You know, it was that stage. And I know there's writers here, and I know you know the stage I'm talking about. You'll just do whatever they say. So I wrote it absolutely graphically the most. <laughs> like hmm. I wrote it graphically. It wasn't hard for me. I've had a lot of therapy. That was not the hard part of the book to write. The hard part of the book to write was Fenton's death and the whale that was caught in the in the uh, fishing net. Yeah. Those were the hardest parts of the book to write. So I wrote it. I wrote it graphically in great detail. I sent it in, and she was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> That's too much. That's not what I meant. So that was funny. Um, <laughs> so then I dialed it like back to like 
one tenth up from <laughs> what she called coy, and everybody was happy. But no, it was funny. I, I thought, well, yeah. Um, one tenth from coy. I like that. <laughs> one, one tenth up from coy. I love that. Yeah. Well, I, either way, I, I just think this is a beautiful book. I think it's a, a piece of, of, of great writing, and I know we have lots of people who have questions about it. So why don't we open up the questions from the audience? Jillian is coming up to get the microphone right now. She's going to kind of put the microphone in front of you, so we are, you know, here in COVID times, we're not going to pass it around. Um, but she'll be right there if you have any questions. Come right up to Jillian, or she'll be finding you uh, for this yeah, Q&A I'll, portion. I'll come, I'll come to you. Make it easy. Just have to raise a hand. Or I'll call on somebody. <laughs> we'll go back to third grade. All right. There. I'm on the move. <laughs> All the way at the other end. <laughs> All right, this is a great question. Who do you read that helps you write? So many people. Um, I would say that my very favorite writers of all time are kind of the usual suspects. Toni Morrison, Alice Munro would head that list. I love the Irish writer Anne Enright. Uh, I also love the Irish writer Calm Toy Bean. None of these people resemble me at all on the page, but they inspire me. I read poetry to be inspired. I love poetry, particularly the poetry of Jericho Brown, um, particularly the poetry of Carolyn Forche. If you want to know the best book, the most inspirational book I've read in COVID times, is Carolyn Forche's memoir, What You Have Heard Is True. It's a glorious book. And it totally, like if anybody thinks, oh, there shouldn't be memoirs, we're all so tired of them, read What You Have Heard Is True. It's the greatest memoir maybe ever, in my opinion. These, these are only my opinions. Um, but I also read so much student work, so much, hundreds of pages a month. and. I get very inspired from that, too, honestly. I mean, I have just been lucky enough to work with amazing young writers my whole career. And, um, you know, some more amazing than others. Like, just to give you an idea, right now, I just finished working with a woman named Jennifer Erdrick, who happens to be related to the famous Erdrick. Um, and she's, she's a doctor. She's, she runs surgery, basically, at Tucson General. She's not 40. She had a baby and got married during COVID and finished her MFA and finished this novel, which spans like the entire 20th century. It's glorious. And um, we're just getting ready to try to get it out to agents and stuff. It doesn't have a title yet, which is why I'm not saying the title. I, it, it's it's an amazing, amazing book. She's Louise Erdrich's niece. Um, but she says she doesn't want any help from Louise Erdrich because they just talk about recipes and she likes it that way. Um, she's humble and brilliant and the overachiever of all time. Um, and then I have this other student at Davis Sawyer Elms, his name is. How about that name for a writer? That's his real name, Sawyer Elms. And he's writing this incredible memoir about being a kid. His dad was in charge of fish and game uh, in Baghdad, Arizona. Game and fish, they call it in Arizona. <laughs> and, um, you know, on the one hand, he had this amazing childhood of, you know, juggling rattlesnakes and catching toads. And there's all these pictures of him when he was like four and he's just covered in mud from head to toe and like floating the flash floods and the monsoons. Like on the one hand, like the best childhood ever. And on the other hand, the not greatest childhood ever because there was like a family friend who was abusing the boys, you know? And it's, and the whole memoir is, 
the whole structure of the memoir are all these imagined scenarios where he tells his dad what happened to him when they're fishing or hunting. It's a gorgeous memoir, you know? And so because I spend so much time with these books <laughs> and I have really very little time to read published books, they're who inspire me and I'm so inspired by them, you know? Um, and, and I wouldn't lie to you and tell you that all of my students are super inspirational and because that's not true, but many of them are. And I get so much energy from my own writing from reading these amazing, these, this work of these amazing people. And, they're, and I say young people, but they're not all young. They're just young in career. And uh, some of them are young. But, I, but anyway, so that. But best book I read during the pandemic, Carolyn Forche, What You Have Heard Is True. Um, I also loved a book called Carrie by Tony Jensen, which is about uh, uh, gun culture and the abuse of women. Essays, beautiful essays. Um, I loved a novel called um, Brother, Sister, Mother, Explorer. That's another student, but the novel's actually out in the world. Jamie Figueroa. Those are some terrific books I read, I've read lately that I took a lot of inspiration from. Am I on? There we go. Oh, perfect. I'm coming. I should have a song, like a theme song <laughs> as I do this. Can you give us an update on the ranch and what's been happening there? Oh, boy. Um, yes. Uh, the ranch is good. We had a rainy summer. Um, we had only one lamb this year. Her name is Opal. She's excellent. We had a, 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 a lamb named Tank last year. Um, so I still have my sheep. I have, um, I have a lot of beautiful Icelandic sheep, seven. I have a big new quarter horse. I've had him about a year named Ben. I bought him a saddle. He was taking the year off, but now I've bought him a saddle. I've started to ride him. He's very handsome, but not an egomaniac at all. He doesn't seem to know how big and handsome he is, which is good. Um, the wolfhounds are Olivia and Henry. Uh, Mr. Kitty is getting a little old and showing some signs of that. We have eight chickens and one rooster who my husband says is not long for the world. Um, so the ranch is really good. Um, Southern Colorado has a bit of a QAnon problem, a bit of a Lauren Boebert problem. You might have heard of her. And it's been a little difficult. Um, I was, it's been a little hard to feel comfortable there as an outspoken woman, as an outspoken progressive thinker. And so, um, so, so I might be moving here. No, <laughs> um, no, I, I seriously, I, 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 that's not. I mean, it's, it, it's a long way from that decision. But we are kind of looking for another place to be. How about that? And, and I really was literally. My friend Karen drove me out to look at things, you know, in Leelanau County today. So, it, it's, it's kind of real. Like, like. This might be the place, you know, we, we, I taught over at a place called Wild Rice Retreat in Wisconsin uh, this summer and my husband and I drove out together and I was like, okay, our job is to fall in love with northern Wisconsin. <laughs> that's, that's our job on this trip. But we didn't quite. <laughs> and we tried to, but we didn't. And the fact is, you know, when I came low those many years ago and went fishing with Jack Driscoll and Doug Stanton and Mike Delp, I went home from that back to the West. Now, keep in mind, I'm from New Jersey, okay? So it's all like an act, this whole cowgirl thing. But, <laughs> but, but I've been in the West a long time now. And, and I went home from the West and I said, you know, I could live there. Like, it's wild up there. Like, it's not the Midwest. It's the North Woods, you know? <laughs> like, and even in that very first trip, I felt the difference. And I felt like why I could, why I could be happy here. And it's, that's all really come back to me in the last three days, that feeling. So we're really looking around for a place 
um, where uh, where we can love the outdoors in the way we do, where there are like-minded people who care about the earth and care about, um, you know, yesterday we had this group. We, we went to Grass River, and so the environmentalist people were there, and the child advocacy people were there, and the art people were there, the National Writers Series people were there, and we stood on a dock, <laughs> and I talked a little bit about how, you know, these crimes are all the same crimes, right? The crimes against children and the crimes against the earth and the, and the um, disregarding of artistic impulses. That, that's all the same machine that wants all of those things to be injured. And, um, and when one of us gets something good, whether it's the arts or children get <laughs> helped out of their abusive homes or a piece of land gets preserved. That's all the same machine too, and it helps each other. And we sat on a dock and talked about this for an hour, and I thought, this is all I want <laughs> in the whole world, is to be able to be with these women and having this conversation and talking about what we're gonna do about it. And so that is really what I want for the last 20 or 25 years of my life, is to be around like-minded people and have those conversations. And unfortunately, I don't have that where I live. I, I drive to that or I fly to that, but I don't have it. So um, so anyway, that's a long update on the ranch. Uh, the ranch is beautiful. We got some rain this summer. We're in a 20-year horrific drought. The rain helped us feel better. Um, the politics are out of control. All right, we got time for one more question, and I see a hand. Okay, who's gonna make up my theme song? Like somebody start singing for me. <laughs> <laughs> Inspector Gadget, yes, done. Go go Gadget, arm. So it, it breaks my heart a little bit to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now I think the fact that you can talk to Colorado and not to Colorado is probably a little opposite. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it real quick for the, the folks at home. That's so cool to say. Do you feel that what you are writing and other environmental writers are writing is moving the needle on how people are thinking about climate change, or are you preaching to the choir because the people that are engaging with it are there with you? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I mean, I, I wrote this book. I mean, I, I don't have an answer to you, and maybe we're all just talking to each other. Maybe here on this hillside, we're all just talking to each other. I don't sort of know what else to do except try to talk to people who might act. Um, oh, oh, I don't know how to talk to the people who don't want to act. You know, I, I try, but I don't know how. Um, or the people who are aggressively thinking that it's patriotic to destroy the earth. You know, I drive a Prius. And this has been the summer of getting the finger in the Prius. Like, it used to be they gave me the finger because they thought I was going too slow or I didn't use my turn signal. But now they just give Pri the finger. It's just what they do. It's just constant. I don't ever not get the finger if I go out in my Prius. And so that's about the fact that I'm offending them deeply by trying to save gas. <laughs> like that's that's what that means. Like I'm being an anti-patriot because I don't want to use as much gas as I possibly can to go to the grocery store. So like that's a hard one, you know, that's hard. And you can hear that I'm a little exhausted. Um, but but all that said, right at the start of COVID, Orion magazine asked a, a, another environmentalist writer in the West, Amy Irvine, who lives in Norwood, Colorado, who she wanted to communicate with 
um, in a series they were doing called Alone Together. No, Together Apart, Together Apart. And she said me, we had never met, I had blurbed her last book. And so we started writing letters for Orion Magazine. And what we wrote about was, you know, how lucky we were to be locked down in a beautiful place where we could still go hiking, but our fear about the future and the COVID experience and so forth. And we wrote 3,500 words worth of letters and we turned it in and it was published. And and then we kept writing, not because we had any big goal in mind, but because we had started to forge a friendship and we wanted to keep writing. Like we were holding each other up in this time of COVID. Um, we both live with kind of um, stoic men. <laughs> so we were allowed to be hysterical and frightened with each other. And we kept writing and we kept writing. And then we got to the end of May of the first year of 2020 and we had like 40,000 words. And we were like, okay, this is something. This is some kind of record of this time. And by that time we had walked, worked ourselves up. Like we were gonna like be like the female Mongolian warriors and we're gonna get on horses and we're gonna like kick the patriarchy's ass. And like by this time we had really worked ourselves up and we were gonna get some shit done. And um, you know, this is all while we're locked down in our houses. And <laughs> And so we called a press, Tory House Press, which is a small press, all women press in Utah. And we're like, hey, we have this book. And do you think if we could make it a book and get it out before the election, we could make some small difference? And they said yes, and they printed it. They, we, we revised it, they printed it. It came out in early September. And then we went on the crazy COVID Armageddon book tour where we drove around in separate cars with boxes of books in the back and we, we were literally dodging fires and we were dodging COVID outbreaks, massive COVID outbreaks. Like it seemed like we were lighting fires with the tailgate of our, or the tailpipe of our car because everywhere we went caught on fire. People came out with their masks and their smoke goggles and we read and we signed books. And, it, and in our area, the desert southwest, you know, the four corners, it caught on. And people would call us and say, can you meet me on the top of Lizard Head Pass with 26 copies, you know? And we, and we said, you know, this is a bit grandiose, but we said we were like the women of the French resistance who like baked the, you know, the messages inside the baguettes and delivered them on their bicycles. Like that's how it felt. And, and I believe, you know, if just not, again, not to be grandiose, but I believe we got some of those ski town women out of their little bunny suits and into action. I believe we did. I believe there were women in Telluride, there were women in Durango, there were women in Santa Fe, there were women in Boulder that, that you know, sent postcards, made phone calls, donated more money. You know, we sort of got people fired up in our little world, in our little corner of the world. But I don't know, I don't know what else, you know, I don't know how to do more than that. I really don't, um, except what I started with today, which is these young voices doing everything I can to get them in the world, because they have a lot more to say than I do. And they, they've come from harder places. Pam. Thank you so much for tonight, everybody. Pam Houston, thank you so much to the National Writers Series. This has thank been a you, wonderful night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, everybody. Be sure to grab a copy of Pam's book if you hadn't already on your way out from Horizon Books. And our next event is September 23rd. We'll have a very, very limited audience home at the City Opera House, and our live stream will be going. So thank you all, and have a lovely evening.